Hello, welcome to House of Rugby. I'm Hugh Wizencroft. Uh, joining you from Qatar, we're staying international this week. Remember last week, Rachel Burford, who joins us, uh, was out in New Zealand and uh, she's now back home alongside Alex Good. Not in the same room, by the way, guys. I hope not. Anyway, you well? Be great. Really good here, mate. Um, disappointed you're not with us, but good. Yeah, I know. I wish I could have been there. Uh, the World Cup, Football World Cup takes... Um, centre stage, I think, in terms of the headlines. But really for us, the Autumn Nation series still there at the moment. And of course, we're still reeling, aren't we, Rachel, from that World Cup final as well. Now that you're home, now that the dust has settled, how are you feeling about the Red Roses in that final at Eden Park? 42,000 fans just wasn't the result we wanted. And of course, came down to that crucial line out right at the end. Still heartbroken? Do you know what? I think even more heartbroken because now the dust has settled and kind of all that atmosphere is gone and back it in the homeland, it, yeah, it's starting to settle the fact that we're not world champions when everything was riding on us being it and we had everything to be world champions. So yeah, big heartbreak and just knowing what the players are going through right now as well, like seeing family and friends and having to relive it with all of them again going to talk about that final a little bit more detail also coming up we'll be talking about England's team to face the All Blacks at the weekend we'll talk uh, as well about Razzy Erasmus and his uh, ban the South African uh, director of rugby of course but just staying with this topic Rachel um, so much discussion I've spoken to so many ex-England players since that final and asked them about what happens now going into the the next World Cup in a few years time which of course we will host uh, in England, um, and whether there needs to be changes. Remember, England had a 30-match winning streak before that final. They were doing incredibly well. They were big favourites. There was a red card that changed things in that final. And, of course, New Zealand were at home and had that on their side as well. Do you think we need to change much? No, I think if we didn't have that red card, then it would be a very different story. And, sadly, one big turning point in the game ultimately resulted in the results that we got. I think naturally at any end of a World Cup cycle, you always look to see if changes are needed. And, you know, the coaching team has been with that squad for a very long time and they have been really successful. So it's hard to kind of say, yes, there should be changes because you look back on the record. But then ultimately, the big prize that everybody wanted, you know, this is 2017 all over again. So an opportunity to get some changes, fresh up some voices, some different expertise in the team could be what they need moving forward. What do you think, Alex, as a player? Does it sometimes hit you that a coach has maybe taken a group as far as they can or maybe as a group of players you just feel like you need something else for your career to maybe help you take another level? Well, I think it's it's tough because Simon Middleton has done such an incredible job, as we've spoken about, how successful England have been over the last eight years, really, apart from the World Cup finals. Um and so it's it's tough to say, oh, is the grass greener if you swap over the coach and change up the voice and have a different opinion? But ultimately, um, England probably have the best resources, um, probably the most amount of players. And sadly, two finals, you are judged on the results and it hasn't worked out. So I guess after eight years, um, regardless of how much success he's had, if there is another candidate who wants to put their hand up and is could do a great job then certainly i think you have to look towards that um you know i don't know simon Otten particularly well so it's difficult for me to really judge but as i said he's had two world cup cycles now sadly it's a results business and regardless i guess of a red card or not red card they were, it's probably going to haunt england more so and him that they were so close and yeah it comes down to that last bit and it's even harder to take when it's you're five yards out and you and you unfortunately can't win um that's even tougher for the red roses to take um so um to answer your question i probably think um maybe he wants to step aside after all this time um but it it probably be a good time to move on any candidates rachel if he were to step aside that you think could do a great job for england i think there's one of the matters that World Rugby and the RFU are really keen is how do we get women back involved at the elite level? 
And there's plenty of those candidates, you know, within England. There's Jo Yap, who's currently director of rugby at Worcester Warriors. She's done the under twenties, England cap, former England captain. Um, you know, there's such a, a big group of of females who have been working within the Allianz Premier Fifteens or done age group as well. So there's there are plenty of good coaches out there, but also women's rugby is now is seen as a really good job opportunity. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if even overseas coaches are interested. Anna Richard, somebody who's very well respected within New Zealand, but actually has been overlooked um, in her own country. You know, we could see cross international um, coming across as well and putting their hand up. I think like Alex says, if, if people realise that there could be an opportunity to be involved in, in, you know, like Alex said, again, most resourced, the most um, player depth, the best league in the world, you know, what a great opportunity to be part of something that could be really special. And I think there'd be a hell of a lot of an appetite to to take that role and, and to, to lead the Red Roses for sure. You know, everyone's talked about the growth of the game from this World Cup, you know, such an exciting final, such an amazing semi-finals. Um, how do how do we keep the momentum for the women's game? Because we've seen other sports where there's a big surge after one event, but they perhaps tail off after a few years. I mean, how how do we keep getting more and more people participating in women's rugby, the growth at grassroots level, the elite level, everything? Well, I think we're in a really good position with hosting the, the next World Cup in three years' time. So it's all about building towards that and making sure the momentum carries through. Obviously, we've got the first ever standalone game at Twickenham, already 20,000 tickets sold and still five months for tickets to continue to be sold. Taking the game around the country, which is what um, the RFU have done so well to keep growing the interest across the UK, not just in its hotspots as previously. But I think that, you know, we've just got to maximise on, on our Red Roses and really showcase who they are, continue the investment. The Allianz Premier 15s, you know, a game every weekend will be live streamed via BB, uh, BBC. So I think the more visibility, continue with the media coverage, but then also getting, getting those Red Roses out to grassroots clubs, getting them in front of players. You know, I remember when I was a kid, there was a male player come along and all of a sudden he was my hero because I saw him and met him, kept me in the game. So I think the more that we just keep building towards that 2025. But we've also got to have a plan post-25 as well. Um, so that's really important. But we've got such a unique opportunity. We already had a massive amount of people watching, 1.7 million people watching on ITV at 6 a.m. as well. Let's remember it wasn't like a normal time in the day. So how do we capture all of those people, uh, particularly young girls, back into the sport? We've got to maximise the Premier 15s, we've got to maximise the Six Nations and just making sure that we get hold of these people and keep hold of them as well. And they're not going to all be players. We still need these people to come and watch the games as well. So that's also a massive factor in how you keep that momentum moving forward. Yeah, it was a peak, I think, of 2.6 million uh, on ITV for, the, for that final as well. And we saw some superstars emerge just finally on this. Um, you know, we've, we've taken the England angle. We do have to give New Zealand some credit. We saw some superstars emerge, um, maybe become bigger stars, even the likes of Ruby Tui. And at the moment at the end of the game, giving a youngster her, her medal, for example, those things going viral help us see women's um, rugby in a different light as well and bring us some superstars some personalities. I think every sport needs that as well. But they also deserve credit for their rugby and the rugby that they played in the tournament oh, as a massively. whole. massively. I think, like, let's remind everybody where they were a year ago. They were over here, played against England, got absolutely thrashed twice by them, went over to France, exact same, and then they beat um, France and England, semi-final and then finals. You know, it's such a remarkable turnaround. They went professional, you know, seven, eight months prior to the World Cup and to deliver what they did and to capture their entire nation um, was really remarkable and, and they deserve that credit and, and you're right about the superstars and I think that's something that's really special about the women's game players are allowed to be superstars it's not quite yet in that limelight where they can't show who they are or that they're a bit guarded by it and you know the likes of Ruby Tui you know part of the reason people tune in is just so hopefully they might catch her on an interview at the end and the more we have that the more we can celebrate great individuals within our game. Yeah, fingers crossed. It all builds for many of those players uh, to a World Cup final at home and a victory. But congratulations to New Zealand. 
And I think it was a great tournament for women's rugby as a whole. So plenty, plenty to build on there. Uh, as I mentioned, plenty to come on House of Rugby this week. We'll be speaking to Joe Marchant uh, ahead of the Bar Bar's latest game, of course. But as ever, you can get in touch with the house via our WhatsApp. Drop us a message. You can drop us a voice note as well. Um, you can find the house number in the description for this podcast episode. Okay, like I say, plenty more still to come. And as always, we want you to get involved. So on that note of the Women's World Cup, I kicked off our new feature, Pass It On, last week. And we've got another shout out from a hero of a grassroots rugby club. Today, we're going to hear from Tilly. I'm Tilly, or Tully. I'm 14 years old and I play for under-16s Gosford All Blacks. I would like to pass this on to Maud Murr. Maud has been a huge inspiration to me and Gab because she reminds us of who we can become. Maud visits us all at training, which we love because it highlights the path we're on, as well as showing us Maud hasn't forgotten where her journey began. I hope that she feels empowered playing for the Red Roses because I know it empowers me. Seeing how far the Red Roses have come and how incredibly they play makes me strive to play at their standards. What a wonderful pass it on note from Tilly to Maud Muir. And Maud Muir has also just been nominated for World Rugby Women's 15's Breakthrough Player of the Year. So remember, if there's somebody at your club, an unsung hero or a local legend that you want to shout out, then drop us a message or even better, a voice note on our house WhatsApp. Perfect. Thank you, Rachel. Um, listen, I think it's been a great period, as I say, for, for women's rugby and more of these stars are going to emerge. And we'll be talking about some of the nominations uh, for the Player of the Year awards in world rugby a little bit later on as well. And some of the great talents that have been on show over the last uh, 12 months. Next, though, we head to a, a much anticipated game, uh, which happened at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. It saw the Bar Bars take on an All Blacks 11 last weekend. It's the start of an exciting month of showcase rugby of course for them now alex caught up with one of last weekend's barbarians uh an england player of course as well in the shape of joe marchin hi joe how you getting on mate hey mate good thanks you're right yeah you recovered from the weekend or the the whole week yeah just about um i mean yeah it was pretty it was a pretty loose week which was uh it was good fun. No, something I've never really experienced before, but uh, no, nah, I really enjoyed it. And uh, I think the liver's, the liver's just about right now. I was going to say, a lot of people have heard about the Barbarians and what it entails and stuff. Vague stories. Just give us a bit of uh, your take in terms of the whole week. You know, not too much detail, but just a, a vague idea of what it was like and how different it is sort of getting ready for a game against New Zealand with the Barbarians compared to preparing for like an England game or a Quinns game? Well, like, obviously getting there is, um, I, was, I was a bit nervous getting there. Obviously there's loads of lads, so many lads I didn't know. Um, getting to know everyone and you know you've only got six, seven days till the game. Like it's the big part of the first, uh, you know, like the icebreakers and, and, and making sure that, you know, you're all going to be on the same page for the week. Uh, and they were awesome with that there. Like first day, obviously it was a couple of introductions um, the coaches spoke. We did the, like a like a video of um, of what it is to play for the Bar Bars to kind of set the tone for the week, which was great. And then after that, it was pretty much just about making connections. So just getting together with the lads and um, yeah, you know, having a couple of drinks, spending some time together, a um, couple of bits of training here and there put in for the week. But I can't even say I got over fifty percent in in training. So you see clips of training, but like. Is it just a bit of touch? Is it just randomly everyone comes up with a trick play and you decide which one's the best? I mean, because my experience in the Barbarians, we we played touch rugby at walking speed. The forwards did a random few line outs. The backs did two plays. And then we all went and quickly got a coffee in and tried to sober up. So anything different there for you? Uh, not too different. I think we, we did do a little bit of, uh, of like a bit of like jogging and like getting through like a little bit of like shape, which wasn't not nothing. I can't say it was anything crazy at all. It was literally just getting people the same calls off nine and off 10. Cause obviously you do need that stuff. That's probably why you won. And my team didn't, to be fair, uh, my barbarian team didn't. So it's probably why you did, a, you did some shape. In terms of the actual, the game itself, like it was like. I didn't really, obviously knew it was going to be a big game and a big, 
Um, like it was going to be tough because obviously the opposition, but I actually didn't realise like kind of how like physically dominant some of those big French lads are, um, which was it was it was pretty mad. Obviously, when you're just playing touch in the week and stuff, and you know there's like a little shoulder on or whatever, you're not really seeing it. But then as soon as the first time you see these people play, it just like kind of put the reality spin on it that you're you're fully in a game. Um, and that these boys want it. Um, but no, the whole week was awesome. Uh, I absolutely loved it. Just just on that, in terms of the different players, like players from France, you know, Kiwis, you know, guys out there, did you, I mean, you've played in New Zealand before, Do you enjoy playing uh, in this game with guys who have a completely different way of looking at the game, um, clubs that have different shape to Quins and different ways of playing? Does that something that really, you really enjoyed? Yeah, it was actually. Um, I, I actually really loved that part of the game where it's something completely different. Like there was a fair few La Rochelle boys there, and um, and like there's a lot of like Kiwi lads in that and uh, South Africans that have moved over to France. Um, and obviously, so they they know each other, know how each other play. Um, a lot of them have done a lot of stuff week in week out, so all that stuff comes quite naturally. But for me, kind of jumping in and obviously. Having um, Ronan Agar as like was doing like the back stuff, and he was like chucking his ideas and on plays. Obviously, Will Greenwood came down; he was chucking a couple of ideas in. But then, pretty much in the backs, we were just <laughs> we were just we were just stood round, just like uh, just like what should we do? Then what would be quite what would be quite fun? And and that was that was the the main part of it. And um, yeah, it was it, it was really cool to be able to do that and and just literally lads throwing it around, having fun, doing some stupid stuff. And if it came off, then brilliant. So. Um, and you mentioned Ronan Nagara there, and you had Scott Robertson as well. What was it like? You know, it's not a proper week's coaching, but what was it like being around those two who are so revered and have such great coaching pedigree? I think that was the thing that got me a bit on the first couple of days was. Obviously, you see uh, like Scott Robinson and Ronan O'Gara and um, Donico Ryan, like the kind of the like hot, the elite level or, that they coach at, and and you've heard like things of how like intense they are and like or or um, how well a, like a, they run systems and how one they how well they've run teams, and to get there and those guys for the first couple of days are leading the charge off the field like is brilliant. Um, I don't know if you saw some of the the headshots, but. Um, but they were those two probably had the the best headshots of the day. If you if you do want to have a look, because uh, they are priceless. Their their eyes are absolutely gone. But it kind of set the tone for the week, and it was uh, it was it was funny. Did Scott Robinson do any break dancing in the change room afterwards when you won, or did you see any of his dancing at all in the week? He was getting a bit excited in the change rooms. There wasn't too many of us left. Uh, and you could tell that he was a bit like he was. He started to do a bit, and the lads were like, "Here we go." And then I think he was like, "No, no, no, like let's just chill." And then like someone would kind of like go to come in and he'd pick it up again. But then now nah, he he didn't break out of form, which I was actually gutted because I actually wanted to see that um, because obviously I've seen you've seen it with like the Crusaders and stuff so many times, haven't you? And uh, and it it looks like it's uh, yeah, it's definitely something you want to see live. Uh, He's got moves, eh? He does. It really does. You know, playing at Tottenham Stadium, I believe that's the first time you've, you've played there, is it? What, what did you make of that? Because I think it's an incredible place. Oh, yeah. The stadium was was, was crazy. Like, the walking in, uh, I've been lucky to play at a couple of football stadiums. Um, and, like, they've all got this just amazing presence about them. And, and especially there, like, on the pitch. And then they've just got the Tottenham emblem like, right at the top in the middle. Um, which is awesome. I, I, there was a point in the game where I was absolutely in a hole, and I was just like, "We just scored," and I was waiting on the halfway, and like, struggle. I was just trying to get all my breath back and everything, and I just look up, and I was like, "This actually, this is crazy." The whole stand goes so far back and so high, um, but even in the change rooms, like you can tell the difference that between the football and the rugby because the change rooms, even in your place and stuff, there was you know the, the air charge and stuff like that. You literally just go put your phone down on the side, charge your phone, little cubby holes everywhere. Like everything was unbelievable. Showers, like so good. Um, yeah, it was an unbelievable stadium. Did, did you um, have your food there pre-match or not? We didn't actually, no. We had, um, we had, we were staying in Park. Did you, have you eaten there? Is it good? Oh, we had it before the game. It is, it's amazing. It's like right next to the change rooms and the food is, it's one of the best meals I've ever had. 
um yeah it was incredible all these chefs lining up cooking whatever you want um you know obviously as well in the showers you've got molten brown it, it's it's high end it's safe to say um so you don't really want to leave there you want to sort of stay the night but obviously you can't um but uh about back to the game again just obviously you faced the hacker before no that was actually my first time oh was it oh, okay um well you got a double one so they when they said before the game they were like we're gonna or the the night before they were like we're gonna go out and um we're gonna like challenge them and 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 uh, the the Kiwi lads are gonna step forward and do it and it was it was so cool to be a part of like I I was there like obviously I wasn't even doing anything but I was like I'm ready here. like <laughs> um but yeah it was it was cool actually just facing it um first time facing it was uh something which was quite special um. And it kind of it does set the tone for the game, really. Like it, like obviously the anthems are done, and 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 obviously with remembrance someday, like it was, um, like minute silence. Everything. There's a big break in between, so that like, kind of going into it just gets the adrenaline up again. Uh, and then it was uh, just straight from the kickoff. It was just a try fest. So, all right, moving on. Who was the um, who would you find like uh, your best mate on the trip or, or the week, or who did you get on with really well? I really got on with um, Aaron Wainwright. Got on with him really well. Uh, never met him before, um, and obviously, like he had been to I think Cardiff, uh, met with a couple of the boys at Quinn. So we started chatting in that in that sense, and then just got on really well. And uh, John Ryan as well, uh, the prop from uh, he's at he went to oh. Wasps and back at Munster now. Um, and he like hell of a hell of a boy. He was um, really really enjoyed his company. Obviously, he's just just um, straight down the middle. Uh, great great crack. And uh, uh, who was best dressed as Peaky Blinder? Best dressed as Peaky Blinder. Uh, Donico Ryan actually came out in a spitting um, outfit of any Peaky Blinders. So he was probably best. Aaron as well, Aaron Wainwright, Aaron Wainwright went really well. Um, in terms of actual best dress, though, some of some of the French lads were were right on it. Teddy Thomas, obviously, um, was a uh, yeah. His his fashion sense was was pretty good, and uh, also Raymond Raw, who's a um, Spartan lad. Uh, yeah, he, he was very well dressed as well. A lot of the French boys were. Uh, who was out the latest? Consistently, consistently out the latest. Well, I think. Marla dipped out on, I think, the Thursday night. He had to go somewhere else. Um, but he was leading the charge uh, quite a bit, um, especially when the mornings came. He was the one who was <laughs> he was looking quite dusty-eyed. So he was, uh, he was leading the charge a bit. So, um, yeah, he was good. Uh, and then to finish off with Barbarians, can you name your Dream Team Sevens Barbarians team? Okay. Okay. Currently still playing, so can't be retired. Uh, my team is Josh Tuasova, um, Hunter Paisami, uh, Quagger Smith, Cheslin Colby, Marcus Smith, um, Semi Odrada, and Damien Penno. That is a class team, to be fair. Really well picked. I've got got to say, very good, very good. They can really mix it physically, and there's offloads everywhere. So fair play. You've got it not to be in there. I'm not. I mean, I thought we were mates, but obviously, prison company. <laughs> we, could, we couldn't pick ourselves. So maybe true, there's a role true. for me as team manager. Um, yeah. Lastly, mate. Um, big game at the weekend. Uh, England playing New Zealand. Won its own Farrell's hundredth cap. Um, you know, how impressive is that? One, having 100 caps your country and two, his level of consistency, really. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think to to get 100 caps for any country is mad, but but for England, um, w- with like the way the, the game's been and, and staying consistently at the top for so long, that's, that's pretty special. Um, and uh, you and you can tell by that obviously every time he steps on the training pitch and every time he steps on the match pitch that he uh, that he it's it's what he wants to do. He's 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 so intense with um, with his direction he's going and and that's probably the reason why he stayed there for so long. Um, well, look, mate, really appreciate your time. Uh, well on the weekend, and we look forward to seeing you out there. Thanks, mate. Cheers.
Great to hear from Joe Marchant there. I think that's a player that, that many people feel still has something to offer uh, in an England shirt. But great to see what he's doing with the bar bars. I'm sure he's going to have a, a, a positive next sort of 12 months. But without him, England go marching on into a game. Sorry. <clears throat> You're right, Rich. You okay there? Everything all right? <laughs> right. <clears throat> So great to hear from Joe Marchant there. Of course, not involved with England at the moment. Fantastic talent, though, the Barbars have with them at the moment. And let's throw ahead to England, shall we? The team uh, has been named. I know you spoke there about Owen Farrell, who will be making his 100th cap for England this weekend. Absolutely fantastic. Congratulations to him. Elsewhere in the lineup, Jack Van Plortfleet will start ahead of Ben Youngs at Scrum Half. Exeter Sam Simmons in at Blindside Flanker Maratoji to the second row as well. Beniva Lapola at eight. Jack Willis cover on the bench. Of course, England and New Zealand go head to head for the first time since England beat them in the Rugby World Cup semi-final three years ago in Yokohama. It's a massive fixture, England against New Zealand at all times. These two sides aren't exactly where they were a few years ago. And I think both of them are looking to find form a little bit. But Alex, I should start by just picking up on uh, your Saracens teammate, of course, Owen Farrell, 100 caps. He's been a fantastic servant for England. Oh, I think um, it's incredible. 100 caps for your country is is remarkable. Um, but to do it at the level of consistency that he's done, it, it is just amazing. Uh, I, I think it, over the last, the whole tenure of Eddie Jones, particularly, he's been a huge leader. Um, he's obviously captain the side. He's, driv he's driven the side standards in training, on and off the field, and you know he, he's just an incredible competitor, a top player. And I, I probably go as far to say that you know if he was from Ireland or France or Wales, he would be a you know a national hero. Um, and he's still got so much to offer. And I think um, sometimes um, it's easy to to pick up on other new players, young players who come through, but he really has been um, the key man of that side for the last eight years or so. Uh, and he continues to showcase how good he is like last weekend against Japan, uh, week in, week out. Yeah, it's that consistency, Rachel, that, that makes Farrell stand out over the last, what, decade now? Yeah, exactly. Like you rarely see him have a, a bad game. And I think you always he always wants more. And I think that's why players get to those kind of milestones is because of the hunger to always get better, always wanting to, to be better than he was. He's not somebody that thinks that he knows all and he's made it to the top and he's now sitting still. He's always moving forward and always trying to improve both on and on, off the pitch as well. Let's take a look at the game, just in terms of its magnitude for Eddie Jones before we talk about some of the other changes in his team. Uh, these two matches, the All Blacks, New Zealand, South Africa as well. Rachel, how big are they for Eddie Jones and his future? Oh, they're massive, aren't they? I think, you know, whenever you come up against New Zealand or South Africa, especially with the history that they have behind them, they're a real marking of where you are as a side and also where you are as a, a leading coaching team as well, set up. You know, whenever you play against the All Blacks, it's one of the most challenging mentally, physically and testing games. And, and it's a good opportunity for England ahead of next year to really see where they are. You know, Eddie's always talking about judge us on the World Cup, judge us on the World Cup. But these moments really count. And where they stand this weekend will, we, will be a real marker of what's what's been left undone at the moment in this side and how... They continue to move forward. And, uh, you know, like anything, you love playing against the All Blacks, especially at home. The last time they um, played England at home, I think, was a number of years ago, and it was a successful test. So hoping for, for the same. But, you know, for the players, it's a brilliant opportunity. You know, the, the Six Nations is one thing. You get to play against these teams year in, year out. You don't often get the opportunity to play New Zealand on your home turf. So they're massive. Ultimate leading question there from you, Hugh, because you uh, you said last week that Eddie Jones would be out of the job <laughs> if uh, he lost all these test matches. So you're hoping to get an angle there. I can see what you're doing there. Very subtle, <laughs> really. Do you know what it is, mate? Do you know what it is? Let's let's be let's be frank about this. 
You lose to Argentina, there's huge criticism. You beat Japan, it's almost like it doesn't matter. There's nothing really been said about England's response because I think people put it into the context of, well, it's Japan at home, you should, you should batter them. And that's what I mean. It turns around now. If we lose to South Africa, I think it suddenly goes back, swings the other way in terms of the criticism back for Eddie Jones as well. And I just wondered, I, don't, I wonder whether that will affect England going forward. I think, like... I think it's a, it's classic English media and us as a as a country is it's so bad and it and it's so good. It's like we weren't terrible against Argentina. We we, we just weren't as clinical. They had two or three chances in the twenty two. They scored every single one. They defended well, and it was our first test match for a number of months. We then played Japan, and everyone's talking about Japan two weeks ago. How they pushed the All Blacks so close and how good they are. And then we beat them comfortably, and uh, the Japan aren't very good. And it's like, and and we're amazing again. And I, and I think England's somewhere between the two um, going into that. And we're only going to get better as a as a team, uh, England, as the whole autumn goes on, and the Six Nations from there on, and there on from there. And to answer your original question about New Zealand and England, where they are, they're both looking for momentum. They're both looking for confidence and momentum going through this the back end of this year into next year ahead of the World Cup. And look, I, I expect England to win at home. I, I always expect England to win at home. And I think they're too powerful for New Zealand. It's going to be a massive test match, a very hard test match. I'm not saying it's going to be comfortable at all. But I think um, I like the side Eddie's picked. Um, Manu's back in the centres. Um, I think Simmons at six. And Billy back is key, really, having that ball carrier in the middle. Uh, to do so, it's hard yards and really dent the All Blacks. I think is massive. So um, it's a, it's a great test. Um, it's a shame that the South Africa game they won't have all their best players, and that is a real shame. But this is the really big game. I'm excited for it, and I think England will come through. Ardi Surveyor, how do you stop him? I mean, a shock that he wasn't nominated for the best player in the world. But you know, you mentioned that back row, Rachel. Are we going to be able to stop him? Oh, I think if all players are stoppable, aren't they? But it's just about how much manpower it's going to take to stop him. He, you talk about momentum, Alex. That that one man has got so much momentum coming into this game. As you say, a lot of people shot that he's not up for World Player of the Year because of just how good he's playing at the moment. But he'll be a man that needs to be marked um, and marshaled really, really well. But the threat with that is that they don't use him and use him as a decoy. Then you can catch you out elsewhere. But let Double mark him. You've got to try and stop him early. Don't give him too much run up because as soon as he gets a bit of steam up, he, he's a very powerful man and he's very skillful as well. So he's able to move the ball and get offloads away. So I think the back row for England will have his name marked down as a target to to make sure that they keep an eye on. Yeah, yeah I think I think with Ali Surveyor, it, it's a lot as well as his defensive work. It's not just his ball carrying, which is, is very good with his footwork and his power. Um, I think it would be more of a challenge for England is the breakdown work, his ability to get over the ball, win turnovers, because that's where the All Blacks are so dangerous. The transition, the most dangerous side in the world when they get a turnover and they they move the ball two or three passes and then bang, you know, Rico Ioane or a winger is out, outside and they're, and Barrett and they're playing on the outside so I think it's a big job for everyone in the team the breakdown is everyone and the speed so I'm sure England used to have a, a thing where when the ball carrier landed someone had to be there and it was like they practiced in training as soon as someone landed on the turf one player had to be there so it's that urgency to get there and the All Blacks are very good over the ball not just Ali Surveyor and that's a big threat to England if they play rugby and they get a bit loose the All Blacks will snaffle the ball and they'll play on the transition, and that's the danger. So I think I expect England to play quite a, a structured game, but when they come into attack, it will be focused around denting them, going through them first, like not trying to go outside them, physically going through them with Billy, physically going through them with Manu Tuolangi, physically using Jack Noel to, to go through, and, and Amaro and people like that, and that's where they get success. Um, we've seen the All Blacks can can get um, opened up with by Ireland in the summer by going through them first and then the space arrives. So, um, yeah, I think that'll be England's main game plan. Okay. How do you see the game going, Rach? 
Yeah, not too dissimilar. I think, yeah, they'll look early at their power game. They got a lot of success for that. If you think back to that World Cup semi-final, dented them really early, then were really clinical. And that's the other thing that they're going to have to be really clinical and take their chances as and when they come um, because there won't be as many opportunities against um, New Zealand like they were against Japan. Um, I, I think, you know, naturally you will see a kicking battle um, really try and test the backfield. Um, you know, put in little crossfield kicks up. Part of the reason why Farrell's in the centres uh, and Marcus Smith as well, being able to execute the little crossfield high kicks. Um, so yeah, I think it'll be a big. It'll be all about the pack um, initially. How that pack move mobily around the pitch, really kind of dominate the physicality. But as Alex said, they've got to maintain and look after that ball in the breakdown area because. As soon as they slow that down, then that allows New Zealand to reorganise, get players on their feet. And then that's when England will have problems when pitches are too not too obvious for them of where to go. OK, all right. Big game this weekend. Uh, England taking on the All Blacks at Twickenham. Of course, we'll react to that next week on House of Rugby. We do need to talk about something that came out of this weekend. Uh, Razzy Erasmus now banned for two matches after criticising, making his latest video, criticising the officials uh, after South Africa's defeat to France, which a lot of people have basically said is bad for rugby. Remember that the, I think it was about 58 minute video he made during the Lions tour as well. Um, and I do think this is just personally, by the way, it does show a disregard for sort of, you know, the traditions of rugby union and what makes the sport special. I mean, it's one thing going into your, your post-match interview and, and criticising an official straight off the end of the final whistle. You know, these laid out videos, I think, go a little bit too far. But you're the players. You tell me what you think about it. Uh, does he deserve to be banned for two matches? He's banned off media, social media as well. He can't take part in any of the match week preparations for the games uh, coming up as well. Big games coming up, Italy and then England. Is that right, Alex? Look, I think... Anything like this, the um, if you want to stop people doing it, you have to have a big punishment. Um, is two games enough? You know, it's not the first time he's done it. Um, look, you know, it's probably uh, not ironic, but um, not ideal. I mean, I got done for dissent at the weekend, so it's probably the worst person to ask. <laughs> but um, you know, I, I think that Rassi doing these videos and going after referees like this does not help the game at all. Um, he knows that the whole of South Africa follows him, uh, behind him, um, and listen to every word he says. And you know they're very vocal on social media already. The South Africans, you see it. Um, and I, ultimately, I, I don't think it's good for the game. Um, I think decisions are there throughout the game. Um, and if he, you pick up on every single one after the game, it's going to be tough. But then we won't have any referees. So. Um, I think it's got to be stamped out, these videos, especially a head coach, someone like him who's so respected. Um, and the only way you do that is by having long punishments and maybe two games isn't enough for me. Rach, what's your reaction? I, I just don't get what he's trying to get out of it other than stir a big pot. And I just think there's better ways of going about it. You know, ultimately, his actions has now left him not with the squad, which is now punishing his own team. And you could pick part pick apart a game every single week and find fault and that's part of our game is that our referees are human they're going to miss things um and you know but at the same time i can understand frustrations you know when you lose a game and there's big mistakes that you feel been left out there then i'm not saying you you shouldn't be able to air those just not publicly like that i think there's a better route there's you know, it's very open discussions with referees that you can have um, post games and, and, and prior to games as well. So I just I just feel like, you know, it's not the right right way of going about things. It doesn't really send a great message. And all it does is, you know, ultimately he's now left himself in, in a worse off position and his team in a worse off position um, for putting those tweets out. Yeah, I, I mean, I think no one wants to see rugby go the way of football where abuse almost becomes commonplace for players, uh, officials. It just shouldn't be the case. You know, we've heard um, Nick White talking about, you know, his little tap on the face. And 
the messages that were sent to him and his family after that, you know, something that, you know, wasn't meant to be a big thing. Razi Erasmus tweeting today, a few hours ago, like myself, the referee of the French test and his family have received threats and abuse. Apparently, it's partly due to my tweets, which is totally unfounded, he says. The tweets were not aimed at the officials, but to our South Africa fans on what we should do better. Have a go at me, not the ref. And then he posted the tweets that he'd sent again for some reason. I think it's the ca- it's the calculating nature of it. That's what it is. It's the if you do it in the moment, as you said, or straight afterwards, there's a tiny bit, there's more a little bit of leeway because your emotions are high. This is a couple of days after the test match. As he's not stupid, he knows what he's doing, and um, I, I think just knowing the people, how many people follow every word he says, and how much of a hero he is in South Africa. He just needs to be more careful with that um, because we don't want death threats or threats to people or any, anyone, let alone referees. So, um, yeah, he, he has to be more responsible for that. And again, as I said, maybe they have to go be stronger on him to stop that or for him to understand how much power he has. Yeah, well, for now, it's a two-match ban for Razi Erasmus, something South Africa fans and players are going to have to deal with uh, very soon. Now, of course, it's Movember and we're going to continue supporting this cause, making a difference across mental health, suicide prevention, uh, prostate cancer and testicular cancer as well. Of course, we've been rating and reviewing the best Movember tashes this month. Um, some of you have sent some suggestions in. This is from Keo, All Black Prop Carl, Two in Ukuafe. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, Ryan says Selfly Half, Robert Dupria. Liam Swan says Freddie Stewart. Charles says the French flanker Charles Olivon. And Killian says the island winger Matt Hansen. Is there a best that you've seen? Maybe someone that you've played against over the weekend, Alex? Uh, I sadly wasn't looking at people's tashes <laughs> when I was playing against them. <laughs> as they, what, as those Northampton players ran straight past you to score another try? Is that what you're saying? You just yeah, they did score a few, but you just got to look at the end result there. You were there, mate. You, you saw, you know, um, I don't know how to put that into the Istanbul of, of rugby, but there we are. Um, I don't even know who's got one. Um, Alex Ozoski has got a bit of a tash. It's quite dirty. Um, but I, I think Mac Hansen is the best of that group. I like his. Um, that with the scrum cap is a good look. Freddie Stewart, I don't know how he's managed it, Rach. I think the tash has made him look younger. I don't know how it, I don't know how that, how, how that works, but he looks more childish because he's clean shaven everywhere else, but just his tash. Mm. It's a very strange look. Classy, but he, he does look younger to me. I'm, I'm just saying. He's pulling it off. Yeah, it's that, it's that baby face that he's got, and then this, the tash is more stand, it stands out more. Um, as you said, the young, youthful look, and then this really thin kind of. Not even strong tash, just the only thing on his face. It's like someone's drawn it on. Um, it, it works. It does. Mm. Somehow it works. Great cause. Yeah, for a man of his stature, I'm expecting him to just carry on Movember by growing a full-blown beard by sort of the end of January. Hopefully he keeps it going and maybe he can look a little bit old, a little bit more manly for the frame of Freddie Stewart. But yeah, yeah. Anyway, you know, he's made a good start to Movember, uh, as of all of those nominations. So thank you for letting us know about your favourites. Um, let's talk about some of what else has been dominating the social feeds for Rugby Joe of late. And welcome back, our admin to the show. Oh, hello, listeners. And hello, Rachel, Alex and Hugh. You make a beautiful throuple. This is Rugby Joe admin here back to provide for all your social feed needs. Trending this week are the World Rugby Awards. I'm seeing a lot of discussion as to the players included, as well as those who have been overlooked. Who do you think deserves the game's ultimate accolade? Let us know on the Rugby Joe social channels, and I'll see you all next week. Yes, do let us know what you think about it. Um, the men's 15 players, the nominations, Antoine Dupont, uh, Johnny Sexton, Josh van der Fleer, Lacanio Am, strong names. We mentioned already Ardi Surveyor not being on it my, may have been the big headline for a lot of people. Alex, what do you think about these? Who stands out? Uh, the standout for me is Josh van der Fleer. I think he's been exceptional. Um, Ireland's 
obviously did well in the Six Nations, but to go to New Zealand and do what they did, he was extraordinary. Uh, he was great in the European Cup. And I think he's just taken his game to another level. So I think he's the real standout for me. Le Canyon was fantastic, but has only played half the games. Dupont, I think the year before was even better. Unfortunately, his standards are so high that it, it's tough to to match that. Um, but, uh, but I think um, for me, it is a shame Ardi Surveyor is not there. Um, I know South Africans would like to see Etzebeth there and Buffelli from Argentina is another name that's been mentioned. But I think um, they're all great candidates, but uh, Van der Fleer is, is the standout for me. Women's 15th player Alex Matthews of England, Law Sanssouce of France, Portia Woodman of New Zealand alongside teammate Ruhe de Mont and Sophie de Goody from Canada as well. Who stands out for you, Rachel? Oh, it's a really strong bunch, to be fair. Um, you know, I think if Law Sanssouce didn't get injured in the second game at the Rugby World Cup, I would think that she would win hands down. She's so good, such a good player. Um, a real leader for, for France as well. And she's actually retiring as well, so it'd be a lovely way for her to, to send off. But um, Alex Matthews, really consistent, you know, one of England's best players um, throughout the entire year. But, you know, <sighs> Ruhe Demant as well. I mean, the transformation she's had with her squad um, and to be named as captain and really lead from the front. And Sophie de Goody is like no other back rower, you know, can do all all the work around the pitch, goal kicker, real kind of big leader for a team. So it's a really strong bunch. Um, oh, I, I'm not sure I can pick one. Um, I would have thought Law Sanseus would be the number one had she had continued to play, but has lost a, a massive... Get off the uh, fence. Missed out on a number of games. Just go Alex Matthews, yeah. she's English. Come on, that's it. <laughs> Just say someone, come on. <laughs> oh, says you. You went through all of them and then decided to chuck Ardy in there as well. Uh, all right, then. Peer pressure at its finest. I'll go with Alex Matthews. Fantastic. Great. Coaches is tough. Andy Farrell of Ireland, Fabian Gaultier, France, Simon Middleton, England's women, Wayne Smith, New Zealand's women's 15 side. So some excellent coaches in there, Rach. Who do you think's done the best job? Oh, that's hard again. Sorry, I'm dancing around these. Like, I just think, you know, Simon Middleton's had an incredible and an extraordinary run with with England women. Um, but he's had a long time with them. Whereas Wayne Smith has literally come in for seven months and turned his team around to be world champions. That is a special coach. Okay. All right. Well, this time she didn't sit on the fence, at least. We got a straight <laughs> answer. We got it quickly. Fantastic. <laughs> Finally, before we go, uh, some more crystal ball action. Last week, you know, I shared a, pr a pretty big hunch about Eddie Jones and his future ahead of the Six Nations. Alex, you predicted Scotland would run New Zealand close, which I think they did. So that's a, a tick in the box for you. Alex, earlier you spoke to Joe March and you got one out of him as well, didn't you? Yeah, I asked him uh, what he thought the result would be between England and New Zealand. I think it's going to be, a t it's going to be tough. New Zealand, uh, they're going well at the moment. But if there's any team that can can take on New Zealand at, at Twickenham and and do a job on them, I think it'll be England. So I think it'll be tight. I think it will all be tight. I think I'm going twenty. I'm going twenty seven, twenty five to England. Right, a specific prediction from Joe March in there. We're gonna to have to send him some sort of prize if he gets the exact score right. But he's keeping his. You know, he's keeping his England future positive by predicting a win for Eddie Jones's side. Exactly what you'd expect him to do. Off air, he probably said 50 points to nil to New Zealand or something like that anyway. But we'll see uh, if his prediction comes true next week. So thanks to Joe Marchant, Alex and Rachel. Thank you for being great company once again. Thank you all for listening. Um, we return for another week of House of Rugby pod next week in the meantime if you want to get in touch please do use the house landline number it's open all hours whatsapps voice notes as well the number is in the episode description we want you to get involved in the podcast so make sure you do loads more great rugby to come this weekend we'll react to all of that next week on house of rugby we'll see you then 